So starting next Sunday, to get ready for that, I'm beginning a sermon series on Peter in the book of Acts. And um, to tie with the beginnings of the church and what can we learn and be encouraged by for, the, for this church as we've gone through five years and as we go forward now. So that was really just a filler while Jason got the camera lined up on me and I got the seat set. So um, we're going to jump right in here uh, from the Gospel of Mark. When they, returned to the other, when they returned to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd surrounding them and some teachers of religious law were arguing with them. When the crowd saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with awe and they ran to greet him. Uh, so often I come across things in the Bible uh, that if I think about the events, they so closely mirror things I've experienced myself. And I think that's kind of, now that I'm almost 50, maybe maturing a little bit and, and getting past, you know, we have this, sometimes what people call this Sunday school faith, which is, uh, is it, you don't go in great depth, you don't ask a lot of questions yet at that point, though I found kids do ask some of the best questions uh, because they don't take for granted some of the things that, that we take for granted. But think in your own life, uh, I'm sure this has happened to all of us because to the best of my knowledge, everybody in here is a human being, which means we've experienced certain things in common. And one of them I think every human is experienced at some point is when, when your emotions and your emotional state can change in an instant by one word or one thing happening, that one moment you can be on top of the world and instantly, like the flip of a switch, you're at the bottom, and you're, you're, you, you go from that kind of mountaintop euphoria to you're down in the valley in the dumps. And, and I don't mean people who are like manic depressant, who are, have a physical, chemical, you know, psychological reason for that. I'm talking about just where you're at emotionally. That's what happens here. Because when it's with they is Jesus, Peter, James, and John. And where they're coming from is what we call the transfiguration. Where Jesus is up on the mountaintop and Peter, James, and John are watching. And he becomes transformed and, and becomes all bright and shiny and glowing. And, and Moses and Elijah appear with him. And the disciples are terrified of what they see. The, it, it, is, it is the way I kind of think of it is they're getting a glimpse into the presence of God. That, that there's Jesus kind of stepping out of his just fully immersed in this world life that we see and, and there for, for we can think about whatever reason we want, why ever it takes place, but the, but the fact it takes place that, that Elijah and Moses, who are now, they're not, I mean, they're not alive anymore. They've been, Moses has been dead for 1,500 years probably. And Jesus appears with them. And so they're on top of the world. And they come down. And what's the first thing they encounter? I can imagine Peter, James, and John, you know, they're just giddy with what they've seen here. And the first thing they encounter, they walk it, they, they come down the mountainside, and there's the other nine disciples and a bunch of religious authorities and a crowd of locals arguing. They have gone literally from a mountaintop experience down into the dumps in just a moment. And, and it says that uh, the people were overwhelmed with awe. That really, uh, that reminds me of, you know, Jesus, he appeared with Moses. And it reminds me of what happened when Moses went up on the mountaintop to talk to God. And it says, the Bible says, there was nobody else ever like Moses that Moses talked to God face to face like one friend to another. God has never did that with anyone else but Moses. And, and when Moses would come down from the mountaintop, the, he would still be like radiating God and God's glory and God's presence from, his, from himself. And, and the people were terrified by it. And they actually, they asked Moses, you know, after you go talk to God and you come back, can you put a veil over your face? Because right now, you're freaking us out. And we don't like this. And it's the same thing. 
Jesus has just had this transformation where he was just glowing and bright and shiny. And he comes down the mountaintop and it says they were overwhelmed with awe. And, and part of awe is an element of fear. They're amazed and fearful at what they see because of, of the sight of Jesus and on their side, and Jesus and the three, Peter, James, and John, on their side, have just gone from this great experience that has caused this kind of aura to be coming off Jesus down into, well, welcome to reality where these things happen. And so as they approach, Jesus says, what is all this arguing about? One of the men in the crowd spoke up and said, Teacher, I brought my son so you could heal him. He is possessed by an evil spirit that won't let him talk. We find out later it won't let him hear either. He's deaf and dumb. And um, remember two weeks ago, we talked about how Jesus redefined this idea of clean and unclean. And said, no longer is it these rules that Moses gave about being unclean, about don't eat pork and things like that. He said, those were things to point you to something and they pointed you to me. And so now we need, he said, we need to understand these ideas of clean and unclean through me. That's what Jesus says. I am the reference point now for clean and unclean. And we saw it then last week where Mark, how he tells the story, says, Someone was possessed by an evil spirit. Well, first he says, an unclean spirit. So we can understand now Jesus is about to put into action what he was just saying about clean and unclean. And Mark says this boy had an, un or daughter had an unclean spirit. And then in the middle of the story, he switches and says, an evil spirit. So we really understand what, what's going on here. And so now we see Jesus confronted here by this man who says, my son has an evil spirit. And I find this interesting. The, the Bible actually doesn't have a lot of details about heaven, but it says one thing for sure, and that if you think of heaven as God's presence, in God's presence, certain things cannot exist. Evil, uncleanness, in a spiritual sense, cannot exist in God's presence. And we're going to see a really dramatic uh, example of what that looks like here just a minute in this reading. And this man goes on. And whenever this spirit seizes him, it throws him violently to the ground. Then he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast out the evil spirit, but they couldn't. Now, people who don't like anything that's kind of outside of our realm of experience. And for most of us living in 21st century America in the Midwest, demon possession is not part of our normal everyday experience. People like that, they want to kind of filter out all these things and explain everything. And they say, well, the boy has epilepsy. That's what's going on. And this isn't a modern thing. This is, I mean, the time of Luther, people were saying, ah, oh, this kid just had epilepsy. They didn't know anything back then. And, and we got to be careful when we say that, though, because we're going to see when this boy is brought into Jesus' presence that epilepsy would not cause him to behave. The epilepsy is a disease or a condition. I don't know. the It's a medical condition, a medical disease that is not aware of what's going on outside of that person. It's not, you know, it's not a, a being independent in itself. And so we're going to see, though, that this simply, it can't simply be the boy has epilepsy. Jesus said to them, you faithless people, how long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. Mary, Jesus has just been up on the mountaintop. He's met with Moses and Elijah. And here's another interesting thing about Moses and Elijah. Well, Elijah, taken up in the whirlwind, right? We know that from Sunday school. Elijah's taken up in the whirlwind. Moses wanders off from the camp one day and just never comes back. And now these two guys appeared with Jesus. These two great leaders, these two great men of God, these guys who, have, who are leading the way into what was coming with Jesus, 
And Jesus comes down and finds these people fighting and arguing and says, you faithless people. The idea of faith is so important. That's what this story is all about. It's not about the demon possession or the epilepsy or anything else. It is about faith. And Jesus says, you people are faithless. You are without faith. Then he says, bring the boy to me. So they brought the boy. But when the evil spirit saw Jesus, it threw the child into a violent convulsion and fell to the ground, writhing and foaming at the mouth. Now this is interesting. Because I realized something this week preparing for the sermon, and it's the boy is not mute and deaf. It's the spirit. The evil spirit is mute and deaf. And that's what stops the boy from hearing or uh, speaking. And, and you think of a child who can't hear, who can't speak, and in so many ways they're cut off from the rest of the world. One of, one of our, the vital ways in which we communicate with each other, speaking and hearing, have been closed to this boy. And, and when I read this story, I often think of, uh, and the high school put this play on, about the miracle worker uh, and, and what it was like for those parents who would do anything to find a cure for their daughter. And I think of this man who will do anything to find a cure for his son who's been this way since he was a child, unable to hear or speak. And so they, they bring this boy into Jesus' presence. And this is how we know it's not simply epilepsy. You know, it would have to be just a really strange coincidence if then, at that moment, the boy had an epileptic fit. There's something much more going on here. And so they bring the boy, and, he, and, the, and the, this evil spirit knows what's going to happen now. And it doesn't like it. It cannot exist in Jesus' presence. Evil just cannot be in his presence. It can't exist in his presence. So Jesus says, how long has this been happening? He asked the boy's father. He replied, since he was a little boy, the spirit often throws him into the fire or into water, trying to kill him. Have mercy on us and help us if you can. What a telling statement. If you can. I got the same looks from several of you I got during the first service when I say that if you can line. He says, help if you can. I get the feeling that this dad has brought his boy to every doctor, every religious healer, and every quack in the country. And every one of them, he said, help if you can. And some of them tried. Some of them maybe didn't even try, and the boy's never any better. And so when he comes to Jesus, Jesus is just another healer to him. He's not going to Jesus because this is the Messiah. That's not why he goes to Jesus. He goes to Jesus because his son needs help, and nobody else has been able to help him, and he can't help him. And so he brings him to Jesus and says, you know, help if you can. If there's anything you can do, Boy, I'd appreciate it. Because this is just terrible for my son. It's tearing apart the family. You know, we've either had it in our own families or seen it in families we're close to with someone who has such a, a dire need like that, whether it's something physical or something emotional or mental or whatever it is, that, that the whole focus of the family becomes trying to take care of that person and that problem. That's where this dad is is at. And he says to Jesus, help if you can. What do you mean if I can? Jesus asked. Anything is possible if a person believes. The father instantly cried out, I do believe, but help my unbelief. That's a great, that's a great confession there. I do believe, but help my unbelief. And, and really, you know, in English, we say if someone is amoral, it means they have no morals. Not they have bad morals. They amoral means no morals whatsoever. So you're a moral person or you're an amoral person with no morals. 
in the Greek, that's what's going on here. It says there is, I have faith, but help my, and they put the letter A in front, my A faith, my no faith, my lack of faith. It's not a, it's not a faith in the wrong thing. It's an absence. He says, help my faith because there's a part of me that has no faith. There's a part of me that doesn't believe. And, and there's something really important here because we notice what the Father doesn't say. He doesn't say, I believe, I have doubts, but I'm going to try all the harder to believe. That's the answer Christians give sometimes. Ah, oh, you just got to believe. You got to believe more. If you only believed, good things would happen. This guy doesn't make a statement. He, says a, he sends up a prayer. He says, I believe, but I need your help. Because I don't believe at the same time. This is what, if you have heard some about what Martin Luther would say, we are simultaneously saint and sinner. It's not, I'm a sinner, then I believe, and I'm a saint. It's, I'm still simultaneously a saint and a sinner. I still, I believe, but I still have this unbelief. And the, and the thing is that unbelief is not the opposite of faith. Unbelief is the normal human condition where we struggle with our beliefs. We struggle with faith. And you think about it, do you learn more when things go easy or do you learn more when you have to struggle with something? I, I've always said the, the worst coaches are those people who have so much natural talent they never had to learn. Whereas the best coaches are those people who, who really had to work hard to learn the game. And, and when I was growing up, uh, I remember Sparky Anderson, coach of the Reds and the Tigers in baseball, wallowed in the minor leagues for years. Never was a very good ball player. But while he was struggling to be as good as those people with all the natural talent, he learned everything there was about baseball and became a tremendous manager. And, and, and those, so we don't want to say unbelief or these struggles, these doubts are the opposite of faith. They are a natural thing that's going to happen when Sinful human beings, broken human beings, have faith and the struggles we will encounter. And it, that's where our growth will come, from those struggles, from those, from those encounters in which all we can do is cry out to Jesus, I believe, but help me in my unbelief. Because at that moment, we're realizing it's not us. It's Jesus. It's not what we do, it's what he does. There's nothing this father can do to heal his son. And so he goes to Jesus and he says, I believe you can heal him, but I'm really struggling with that. And so I'm lifting up a prayer to you to help me in that. Because you're the one who can help him. When Jesus saw that the crowd of onlookers was growing, he rebuked the evil spirit. Listen, you spirit that makes this boy unable to hear or speak. He said, I command you to come out of the child and never enter him again. The boy's father can't make that command. He doesn't have the, the authority, the power to do that. The other nine disciples who were there couldn't even do it. That's why the man has to turn to Jesus. And Jesus commands, and we hear the, the spirit finally makes a noise. It says, then the spirit screamed, and then threw the boy into another violent convulsion and left him. The boy appeared to be dead. A murmur ran through the crowd as people said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and helped him to his feet, and he stood up. Now, wouldn't that be a nice place to end? That'd be a great place to end this story. But Mark tells us there's a little bit more we need to know. Afterwards, when Jesus was alone in the house with his disciples, they asked him, why couldn't we cast out that evil spirit? Jesus replied, this kind can be cast out only by prayer. 
as much as I like and can gravitate towards that father's cry, I believe, help my unbelief, as much as I like that, I don't like this. I don't like that Jesus says this kind can only be cast out by prayer, because you know what? He never prayed. He didn't pray, and he doesn't say, oh, only you could cast it out with prayer, but I could do it. He says it can only be cast out by prayer, but he doesn't pray. And that has bothered me since I was a little kid in Sunday school. And first, I first remember hearing this story. It's like, but he didn't pray. What's going on here? That's where I say sometimes kids ask questions that we don't ask because we take things for granted. Jesus never prays. And it's bothered me since I was a little kid that he never prayed here. But he said, this kind can only be cast out by praying. On an aside. Think of if you have an old book at home from when you were a kid or maybe your parents had when they were kids, how old and ragged that book would be by now. Think of the Bible written 2,000 years ago. We don't have any, you know, we don't have a guy. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, James, all the guys who wrote the New Testament when they wrote that, we don't have any bound copies. We have copies of copies of copies because it's been 2,000 years and that's a long time ago, a long time for a book to last. And, and all of them were written by hand. And in some of them, it says in this passage, most of them say this kind can only be cast out by prayer. But some of them say this kind can only be cast out by prayer and then whoever was writing it down added and fasting. Well, that's no help because Jesus didn't fast either. He didn't sit down and fast and pray, Spirit, leave this boy, and then it happened. He just said, leave the boy and never come back. And this has troubled me until this week. I finally got an answer to my question. Jesus didn't pray what's going on here. And it came from this guy, Jerome. That's a statue of him that's actually in Jerusalem. Jerome lived from 347 to 420, so he was born about 300 years after Jesus died. And Jerome is most famous for the the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, the New Testament written in Greek, because that was the common language at the time. But by the time Jerome lived, everybody was speaking Latin. So he's the guy, he's famous, that he took that Hebrew Old Testament and that Greek New Testament and wrote them in Latin. And for over a thousand years, that was the Bible everybody used, at least everybody in Europe. That Latin Bible that Jerome wrote. It wasn't until getting around the time of Luther, people started taking that Latin and kind of relearning Greek and Hebrew and getting it into the language of whatever they spoke in that area. So he's kind of a big name, and he's probably the number one reason that, that Catholics up until not too long ago still did services in Roman, or in Latin, rather. And, and Latin is, is held on in large measure because he put the Bible in Latin, and that's what people used for a thousand years, the Latin Bible. But I was reading something he wrote about this passage, and he noticed it too, that Jesus doesn't pray. And, and he's like, Jesus says this kind can only be taken out by prayer and fasting, kind of in parentheses, But he doesn't pray and he doesn't fast at the time. So obviously Jesus doesn't mean you have to pray, you know, take this spirit out of this boy and then the spirit will leave the boy. That's not what Jesus means by prayer, Jerome says. So he says, so Jerome looks back at the life of Jesus and he says, oh, here's a time Jesus prayed and fasted for 40 days. Jesus prayed and fasted after he's baptized goes in the wilderness, prays and fasts for 40 days, and then he begins his ministry. And Jerome says, that's what Jesus means. When he says about prayer and fasting, he's talking about being connected with God ahead of time. That we're already in this state of communion with God. Communion would be the old church word. The word that's in vogue now would be to say we're in a relationship with Jesus Christ. 
that's what Jesus is talking about. The prayer and the fasting, it's, it's not, the example I use sometimes with confirmation kids is, prayer is not a, like a vending machine. Or God isn't a vending machine, the prayers are coins. We, we don't put our prayers in the machine and press the button of what we want, and then it comes out the bottom, and, and there you got it, like a vending machine. Rather, what Jesus is saying is this prayer is a way of life. It defines our relationship with God, this tight communion. And so when this man says to Jesus, I believe but help my unbelief, he's acknowledging that he can't get that relationship to work right on his own and that he needs Jesus to make it right and to complete it and to bring it to fruition. And that's really, um, that's really what's going on here in this story is that faith is not a work. Faith is not something we do. Faith is who we are. Faith is what we believe and how that belief is lived in our lives. And if we could do that perfectly on our own, we would not begin our services with a confession of sin and pronouncement of forgiveness because we wouldn't need it. We would just do the right thing all the time. The, the, the words of Martin Luther here, some of the most wise words he ever wrote, he said, I believe that on my own, I can't believe. In other words, I believe, help me in my unbelief. It's not just help me overcome my doubts. It's more than that. It's help me live with my doubts in faith. Help me hold on to my faith in the midst of those doubts as those doubts assault my faith. Help me hold on to my belief. And, and in turning to Christ, we see that, that, the, that faith, again, is not something we do, but it defines this relationship, this communion with God through Jesus Christ because we don't have the power that Christ has. And, and when we believe in him, it's not like we become supercharged, perfect people like he was, where we can lay our hands on people and heal them. That's not what it's about. It's about becoming dependent on Christ and becoming dependent on the work that he does because that is where our hope lies. So let us pray. Lord God, I would give you so much thanks for this encounter and for this, this father who, who cries out in anguish that he believed, but he struggled. He had real struggles. He was a real person. And he, and he wanted to just cling to what Jesus had to offer, but he needed Jesus to do that for him. We pray, Lord, that we will never forget that that we are not the center of this story, that Jesus Christ is, and that in all our daily struggles, that you will help us to cling to him, help us to cry out to him for help in the face of things we struggle with in all our days in our life. And we pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen.